the long storied history and interconnection of Israel and Africa is rich and mystical. Africa is mentioned numerous times in the Bible. The Hebrew slaves, of course, were divinely redeemed from bondage in Africa. And the story of the Exodus to this day resonates with Africans and African descendants all over the world. Theodore Herzl himself said, I'm not ashamed to say, though I may expose myself to ridicule for saying so, that once I have witnessed the redemption of the Jews, my people, I wish also to assist in the redemption of the Africans. But this storied relationship is not just relegated to ancient times. The modern state of Israel has been intimately involved with the nations of Africa since the early days of African independence as an innovative, developing country that benefited from the know-how and resourcefulness of the Jewish diaspora, Israel was eager to share its human resources with the fellow emerging countries of Africa. That experience, exemplified by Golda Meir's insistence that a cornerstone of Israel's foreign policy was a strong relationship with Africa, lingers in the collective memories of Israelis and Africans. Notwithstanding the years of severed ties due to the pressure from the Arab bloc, the last decade has transformed relations between Israel and Africa. And because of the vision of courageous leaders and the spark of curiosity and innovation from civil society, the sky is surely the limit when it comes to the future of Israel-Africa ties. Our program today is meant to celebrate, highlight, and explore this extremely fascinating and important relationship. And that's why we're fortunate to be joined by six distinguished guests who can shed light on the different aspects of the emerging Israel-Africa bond, each with their own unique set of experiences and expertise to our discussion. We're joined by Ambassador Sharon Barley, Deputy Director General and Head of the African Affairs Division at Israel's Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Ambassador J. Peter Pham, Distinguished Fellow at the Atlantic Council and former United States Special Envoy for the Sahel region, a band of territory in Africa that stretches from the length of the continent, from the Atlantic coast of Senegal and Mauritania to the Red Sea coast of Eritrea. Togo Foreign Minister Robert Duse, who in a special message will talk about the unique and historic importance of the Israel-Africa relationship. Sivan Yari, founder and CEO of Innovation Africa, a nonprofit that brings Israeli solar, agricultural, and water technologies to African villages. Yossi Abramowitz, president and co-founder of Energia Global, who has been nominated three times for the Nobel Peace Prize. And Ambassador Herman J. Cohen, former Assistant Secretary of State for African Affairs under President George H.W. Bush. Thank you all for tuning in. Now, let's jump into our first conversation. Joining us to talk about the emerging Israel-Africa relationship from a diplomatic perspective is Ambassador Sharon Barley, Deputy Director General and Head of the African Affairs Division at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Israel. Ambassador Barley's career in the Israeli diplomatic service spans over 25 years. Prior to her appointment as Deputy Director General and Head of the African Affairs Division, she served as Deputy Chief of Mission in London and has previously been posted to various diplomatic missions at embassies in Turkey, Australia, and Uzbekistan. Ms. Barley was the first Israeli ambassador to Ghana after 38 years in which Israel had no resident embassy in Accra. Ambassador, thank you so much for taking the time out of your busy schedule to be with us today. It's so important that we hear from someone currently on the front lines of the incredible work being done today between Israel and Africa. Thank you, Dan, and thank you for having me. Well, we'd love to hear uh, a bit about your first experience in Ghana, working as the first Israeli ambassador there after 38 years in which there was no Israeli embassy in Accra. Um, you know, as a, as a boy, I remember uh, independence in Ghana. It was a, a tremendously big story. Uh, and then as I grew and became aware of the tremendous involvement that Israel and many African countries had in that period, uh, it was quite a story. And then came to an end and you came back as, as ambassador 38 years later. Tell us about that experience. 
Well done. Uh, I actually had the privilege to be a real pioneer, you know, coming to be a resident ambassador after 38 years, after 38 years of absence. Everything that I uh, uh, done was actually being done for the first time. Uh, and uh, it was a great excitement. As you know, uh, uh, Ghana is a country uh, in which there is great love for Israel. There is a, a, a great affinity to Israel uh, based on a, a, a religious uh, a, a belief. And the, a, the warm welcome that Israel has received there was just phenomenal. Uh, we've done so much there, both on uh, development and on the economic sphere. And uh, we really managed to uh, create a real change, both in the sector of public health, when it comes to a, a neonatal uh, health and a, a infant's mortality, um, we've established there two neonatal units that uh, worked closely with the medical staff in uh, Kumasi, the second biggest uh, city in Accra. And these units are actually still, uh, 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 they still exist and they're active and they're working together with uh, uh, Israeli teams and uh, uh, implementing the Israeli methods that were taught then and are saving uh, uh, so many uh, uh, babies' uh, uh, lives. And the second field in which we've done really a tremendous work was the field of early childhood education, uh, in which we've created no less than a revolution uh, uh, in that sector. So I can tell you that um, I really feel proud and privileged to, to have the chance to take part in, in you know, these uh, first years of uh, reestablishing Israel's diplomatic presence in Ghana. Well, let's look a little bit uh, more broadly now. Israel's huge success story in just 74 years, its size, its location, its remarkable achievements, uh, being at the forefront of, of so many innovative fields, uh, leading in medicine, technology, agriculture, energy, etc., in many ways is a great example for African countries that are also quite young. Um, they are also similar in terms of, of climate in some cases and face many of the same kinds of challenges in that regard. So how has the Israeli experience helped African nations in terms of, for example, water scarcity, agriculture, uh, health issues, et cetera? Dan, I think that uh, uh, you've hit the, the nail on the head. Uh, the fact that Israel itself, just 75 odd years ago, was a developing country itself, gives us uh, uh, a great, um, um, I think that it gives us great perspective and uh, uh, great advantage uh, when we are coming to work together with our African partners. I mean, Israel is an example of a country that was a developing country itself, an arid uh, a land, uh, a country that was boycotted, isolated, and yet again, uh, we have emerged as a, a, a leading country. We've a, a, a turned the necessity uh, uh, into into the into an invention, and uh, uh, really we became a, a as you said leading country when it comes to uh, water management, when it comes to agriculture, uh, uh, and so on. And I think that uh, the nice thing uh, uh, about uh, our diplomacy in Africa today is that we are uh, working together with young populations in the continent. We are uh, uh, trying to hook up into the fact that in many countries in the continent now, there is a technological leap right? People who uh, 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 were never connected into a phone landline are uh, owning two cellular uh, uh, devices, right? People who never had a bank account yet, they're trading with mobile money on their phone. The fact that they were never connected to electricity, but now they're using uh, uh, solar energy and so on. And Israel has uh, not just the technology, it's not just about the know-how, it's also about the do-how. It's about the experience, it's about being able to 
uh, uh, have boots on the ground in these countries, not through some large consultancy companies, right? We're doing it through uh, development experts that are working in a very modest way with communities, with uh, 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 trainers who can later on build capacity, train other trainers and so on. And uh, um, one of the sectors, one of the fields in which we are doing a lot of work in recent years, which is actually crossing so many sectors is the field of uh, uh, innovation and entrepreneurship, uh, which in which we are really trying to hook up to young populations and give them the tools to grow their ideas and develop their ideas and turn them into businesses. I can give several examples. For, for example, in Rwanda, in 2018, we've established a horticulture excellence uh, a center, which is really encouraging young entrepreneurs in uh, an Israeli uh, a, a style, exciting style, I should, I should say, a, a say, to dare to be ambition, to come with their ideas related to agriculture. And you know, these uh, ideas, the, the, the fact that they're being accompanied by our experts and the Israeli way of looking and thinking at, at things are actually turning these young farmers, if you like, from, uh, uh, they're helping them to turn Rwandan agriculture from subsistence agriculture into a commercial agriculture, very effective, very efficient. Uh, uh, and, and, you know, nowadays we're talking about precision agriculture and so on. Another example uh, uh, for is uh, Nigeria, in which we've created uh, an accelerator, uh, which is working together with uh, students from different academic uh, uh, institutions and are helping them actually to turn their ideas into, uh, um, into businesses. They're helping them actually to pitch it to uh, investors. And uh, uh, just recently, we've heard about some great success stories. It is called Make Lab. It is supported by the a vice uh, president in Nigeria. And I can tell you that in these very days, we are looking into emulating this uh, 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 accelerator into additional uh, uh, African uh, uh, countries. Uh, and we are looking into partnering with some very exciting uh, uh, partners. So this, is, uh, uh, so this is something that is happening as well. And really the advantage is that Israel has both the know-how and the do-how. We have the experience, We've been there, we've done it. Uh, and I think that uh, uh, the fact that we are still a young country and that uh, Africa is a young continent with a huge young population that is highly connected, that uh, is seeing what is happening in other places. Uh, uh, they are on, on digital media. They, they see what is taking place in, uh, in other countries and they have aspirations, they have uh, uh, hopes, they have wills, and I think it creates great energy. I know that uh, for decades, um, Mashab, which is Israel's foreign assistance program, um, invited uh, many uh, from not just Africa, but from around the world uh, to come to Israel to train in Israel um, and I think of the agricultural sector as, as one. Uh, is that still continuing? And how important is it uh, to, to actually have folks be in Israel to train as opposed to on the ground with Israeli uh, advice and, and trainers? Well, of course, that uh, uh, having trainees coming to Israel is still going on and uh, uh, it is taking new shapes and new forms. Uh, which I'm going uh, uh, to share with you. And needless to say that once uh, uh, being able to welcome someone into Israel uh, and uh, giving him the opportunity to see for himself, to feel for himself, to be able to speak to Israelis in a non-mediated uh, uh, manner and to have his own impressions uh, creates uh, uh, ambas ambassadors, if you like, Many uh, young ambassadors 
for Israel, for Israel once they go back to their countries uh, of origin. I can tell you that the uh, uh, Mashav has developed a relatively uh, a new program uh, which exists for around a decade now of uh, uh, bringing uh, trainees in agriculture for a period of one year, 11 months, in which they both work on the field together with Israeli farmers, as well as studying theoretical studies uh, uh, of agronomy in the class. And this combination uh, in which they can both study the theory and then practice it uh, in Israeli farms really are, is a great combination that is turning them into very, very effective farmers once they go back to their countries. And I can tell you that uh, um, presidents of uh, uh, African countries are mentioning this program in their speeches, in their meetings, because it creates huge, huge change. We're talking about uh, uh, hundreds of trainees coming from different countries. And uh, moreover, those of them who upon their return come up with an idea for a small business uh, or a small initiative in the agricultural field, and they present us with a business plan and they present us with uh, uh, their vision about their business, we are creating uh, uh, microfinancing uh, uh, schemes for them, and Mashav is. Mashav keeps supporting uh, uh, them, uh, implementing their uh, uh, ideas and, and really bringing it into real life. And this is, this is the new element that uh, uh, we've introduced to the system just several uh, uh, years ago. So we, we do try to constantly realign ourselves with new trends in development. Uh, uh, we are embarking on new sectors and new fields, uh, um, not just the classic traditional uh, agriculture and water management, but now we are looking into cybersecurity and we are looking into uh, a renewable energy and a, a climate change. And of course, the, the very big issue these days is of course, uh, food security. Where are the... Um areas of strategic interest between Israel and, and Africa? And why is Africa's stability in Israel's interest? You know, Dan, we are in a very unique point in time. Uh, we are in a unique point in time in our relations with uh, African countries because of the recent developments in the Middle East. And of course, I'm relating to the uh, Abrahamic uh, uh, Accords. You know, uh, uh, these developments, the normalization of uh, relations and the peace agreements that were signed have taught us now in a perspective of two years, they've taught us three main things that I think African countries have noticed as well and took it into consideration. They have taught us that Parties do not necessarily have to agree on the full scale of political uh, uh, issues in order to work together and cooperate on issues of mutual interest. We can have respectful disagreements on certain issues and yet work closely together on other issues. The second thing that it taught us, it taught us that one can support the Palestinian people and be a friend of Israel at the same time. This is not a zero sum game. You can support the Palestinian people and yet have diplomatic relations with Israel and yet advance cooperation with Israel on uh, issues of interest. And the third thing that it taught us is that looking at nowadays challenges, be it regional security or fighting terrorism or cyber security or food security or climate change, or, or of course, uh, a pandemic, no country can face these challenges by itself. We have to cooperate, we have to work together. And uh, these, these lessons have trickled down also 
uh, 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 to African uh, countries, to African leaders, when they're looking at the challenges and you yourself uh, uh, mentioned that there are some strategic issues. And uh, uh, really, if we are looking at uh, a, a stability of regimes, if we are looking at a, a terrorism, if we're looking at uh, um, smuggling of uh, a arms, of narcotics, of uh, uh, um, uh, uh, rogue elements, if we're looking into uh, freedom of uh, uh, sailing uh, in the Red Sea, uh if and especially on the backdrop of uh the ukrainian a uh, 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 crisis of the war between uh, uh, russia and ukraine uh uh which is now uh, uh creating uh, a far larger movement of uh, uh, energy through the red sea i mean all of these are creating uh uh mutual interest between israel and African uh, uh, countries. The fact that Israel uh, shares a border, a land border with African continent uh, makes Africa's stability, Africa's security and Africa's prosperity an Israeli interest. And therefore it is extremely important that we will work together. And I want to tell you another thing, you know, on the backdrop of the Abrahamic Accords, we see now that there are more Muslim governments talking to the Israeli government than ever before. And I can tell you that even in Africa, countries which don't have full-scale diplomatic relations with Israel are now taking a lot of interest into engaging with Israel in different levels of intensities, on different uh, uh, fields and sectors, but we feel the interest, we see the interest, and uh, I think that there is a realization that Israel nowadays is no longer part of the problem, but on the contrary, Israel is part of the solution. Israel has something to offer. Israel is a force for good in the world, and uh, we, we, we feel it, we see it, and I think that it will take time. It's a process, it's an evolution, not a revolution. I'm glad to say that we see signs of it also uh, uh, in international organizations at the UN Fora, for example. Uh, we see more and more African countries that are uh, taking sovereign decisions when it comes to uh, uh, voting patterns with, uh, about Israel. We see them daring more and more to have their own independent approach and not being part of an automatic uh, uh, negative vote as part of the a, a non-alignment group. And I think that uh, they realize that it is time to create oneself uh, a new relevance if you stick to uh, rejectionism, uh, then you stick to 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 the past. You you stick to to an approach which is no longer relevant in a, a today's world. And I think that there is also a realization that those who uh, uh, will be the last ones a, a, to dare and to make this uh, these political steps and and. Uh, to cooperate with Israel, we'll get the list. You know, your point about the Abraham Accords opening the door uh, to so many possibilities uh, in Africa, I think really uh, rings true. As you say, we've seen it on votes in recent years, shift of votes where there are sovereign decisions. No, no question about that. But, but really, if you look back 10 years, I mean, this process of, if you will, Africa rediscovering Israel, um, really uh, has, has been taking place uh, over the past decade. And I, I've looked at the list of, of foreign ministers or presidents who have made their way uh, to Jerusalem uh, to visit with, with you and your colleagues um, to talk about 21st century issues like cybersecurity. Um, 
really indicates that the, this process was already underway. And now with the Abraham Accords, it kind of gives it an extra impetus, would you say? I, uh, I agree with you. It gives it uh, extra impetus. It legitimizes it. Yes, it, it's, it, it makes it a, a, not only kosher, but I would say almost fashionable. Uh, to uh, to be seen together with uh, uh, Israel, uh, to consider normalizing relations with Israel as a choice uh, uh, which is made for the benefit of the people and uh, uh, for the interest of the people. Exactly as I said, Israel is is uh, it's a process in which there is a realization that Israel can be part of the solution. And again, I'm, I'm turning back to the lessons that I've mentioned. It's the realization that you don't necessarily have to agree on the full spectrum of political issues. We can agree to disagree on certain issues. We can have different approaches and yet work closely together on uh, uh, other issues, on issues of a, a common interest. And I think that at the end of the day, there is no substitute uh, for dialogue, for direct uh, uh, conversations, for these visits in which our leaders can sit together, can listen to one another, can better understand each other's perspectives. Um, and when you look at Israel's contribution and what it is yet to contribute, the potential there is is just so huge that, uh, uh, you know, the responsible uh, thing to do uh, uh, by any African leader will be to hook up with Israel and, and to see how this uh, uh, new partnership can really uh, uh, bring prosperity, can uh, help fight desertification, mm -hmm. can uh, 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 bring solutions into this huge uh, 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 food security crisis uh, that Africa is facing now with a horrible drought and on the backdrop of the war in Ukraine and the grain crisis. Israel is there with really good solutions, great offers. So it's only natural. It's, it's, it's a natural connection. And we haven't touched upon the, the, the historical elements. You know, uh, I, I mean, the, the Israeli-African partnership is there since biblical times. When the people of Israel faced drought and hunger, they marched to Africa, they marched to Egypt, and it was Africa that was feeding the Israelites, the Israeli people. So I think that it's only natural that 3,000 years later, it will be Israel who will assist facing food security in Africa. That's a great historical connection. Tell us about the emerging relationship between Israel and, and Chad and what that means for uh, the broader relationship of, of Israel and Africa together. Indeed, Dan, uh, the relations with Chad uh, uh, is one of the more exciting developments that have taken place between uh, 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 Israel and African countries in recent years. Uh, Chad for us is a normalization country. If you like, young relations were renewed in 2019. Uh, then Corona uh, virus uh, uh, came and of course held back the ability to travel and to build these relations, but I'm so glad to say that uh, uh, these relations are now really uh, 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 have uh, turned a corner and we see growing cooperation between us and Chad. Uh, just last month, our ambassador has presented his credentials to the president of Chad for the first time in 50 years that an Israeli ambassador presented his credentials uh, uh, to the Chadian president. So uh, uh, this is really a piece of history. We are now working on a beautiful project of establishing an emergency unit in one of the hospitals in N'Djamena. And uh, uh, there is a lot of movement of delegations uh, back and forth between Israel and Chad. And the beauty about it is 
Tophet, Chad, a Muslim country in the heart of the Sahel, uh, uh, being a, a, a country in a, uh, uh, in a geographical block of countries which have no diplomatic relations with Israel, have really taken this courageous step. And moreover, they're not trying to hide it. They are uh, proud of it. Uh, uh, they give great uh, uh, media coverage uh, to our delegations, to uh, uh, the projects that we're doing together. So uh, uh, it is really encouraging and, and a, a, it's a, a new, uh, really it, it's, it's, a, it's a new element that we are very proud of and its implications um, are far greater than just Chad because as I said, Chad is in right in the middle of the Sahel region. Uh, uh, it is bordering with Niger and with the Sudan and not too far from Mali. And these countries are looking at Chad and believe me, they see what is taking place there. They are curious about it. They find it interesting. They find it intriguing. And this can really be on a long term, a game changer for us in this region. So we are really happy about that. I have one final question uh, to localize the discussion a little bit. Uh, looking at particular uh, now at Rwanda, uh, Benebrith convened a conference in 2020 marking 75 years since the Holocaust and 25 years uh, since uh, the Rwandan genocide. And our people, Israelis and Rwandans, share that particular trauma of genocide and, and dehumanization. How do you think this fact has shaped the Israel-Rwanda relationship? And what do you think the uh, potential of this relationship is? Might the Israel-Rwanda example reach beyond, or maybe it is already reaching beyond the borders of Rwanda? Dan, I think that it is definitely reaching uh, uh, beyond the, the borders of Rwanda. Uh, it is a unique uh, uh, partnership and unique relations uh, that exist between Israel and Rwanda, two small countries, two countries that uh, uh, have suffered uh, 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 such a horrible uh, uh, atrocity, and uh, two countries that have decided uh, to resurrect themselves in a way. Uh, and uh, really, uh, we have great partnerships with Rwanda on so many different uh, uh, fields. I think that these relations are yet uh, 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 to grow more and more. They have not reached their full potential yet. And uh, uh, I can tell you that uh, neighboring countries are looking uh, uh, at uh, these special relations, and some of them, you know, they, they're aspiring to have uh, 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 similar uh, uh, partnerships and, and, and such uh, uh, close relations as well. You've correctly mentioned that uh, uh, sharing this uh, 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 history, in a way, helps us better understand each other we, it creates a connection from uh, a place of a, a pain and vulnerability, uh, but this vulnerability does not make us uh, weak in in any in any manner. You know, on on the contrary, we have the we have the ability to relate. A, a, to one another and to be vulnerable without being weak, which I think is a great strength. Well, thank you, Sharon, for shedding light on the growing Israel-Africa relationship. And best of luck in all the important work you do going forward. Great. Thank you very much, Dan. It was a pleasure. Well, with us to share his diplomatic and geopolitical insights on the Israel-Africa relationship from an American perspective is former U.S. Ambassador J. Peter Pham. Ambassador J. Peter Pham is a distinguished fellow at the Atlantic Council, which he rejoined in March 2021 after concluding public service 
as United States Special Envoy for the Sahel region with the personal rank of ambassador. He had previously been Atlantic Council Vice President for Research and Regional Initiatives and Director of the Council's Africa Center. From 2018 to 2020, Ambassador Pham served as the United States Special Envoy for the Great Lakes region of Africa at the U.S. Department of State with a mandate from Secretary of State Mike Pompeo for coordinating the implementation of U.S. policy on the cross-border security, political, and economic issues in the Great Lakes region, with an emphasis on strengthening democratic institutions and civil society, as well as the safe and voluntary return of the region's refugees and internally displaced persons. In March 2020, he was appointed the first ever U.S. Special Envoy for the Sahel, in this newly created position, he assumed the lead in shaping, devising, and coordinating U.S. strategy in the Sahel, as well as coordinating with international partners and U.S. government stakeholders to help stabilize the Sahel through programs to enhance security and support governance, political liberalization, social progress, and economic development. We are honored to have Ambassador Pham with us today. Welcome. Pleasure to be with you, Dan. Well, to start off, I think it would be helpful for our viewers who may not be as familiar with Israel-Africa relations, if you can briefly speak about the history and the current underpinnings of the relationship. Um, and perhaps you might want to comment on um, the very strong, devout uh, Christian communities in Africa that admire Israel from Kenya, Uganda, Nigeria, the list goes on. Um, they're very much pro-Israel because of the, the Christian connection. So please. Tell us about that. Well, in, in many respects, the, the, the history of Israel's relationship with Africa really goes back, and it's fascinating, at least for someone like me who loves history. It, it's, it's parallel to the uh, history, if you will, of Zionism in Israel it, itself. Theodor Herzl himself wrote in the old New State about the relationship that the state that he was dreaming to build and uh, its potential relationship to the then colonized uh, African peoples and the, the sense of bond that he, he felt there. And certainly from the very beginnings of the state of Israel, there was strong outreach to Africa. Uh, Gota Meir uh, in her time and in her memoirs writes about the strategic uh, uh, argument for it, as well as the moral and ethical one. Arguments which I think still resonate today, all these years later, that Africa is the largest voting bloc in many international institutions. Uh, at the same time, there are numerous things that can be shared in shared experiences. The struggle against Islamist terrorism and uh, extremism, the technologies that the startup nation and Israel's own experience of greening the desert and things like that that could be shared. And there are NGOs and Others, I'm sure in this program, others will share th their experience. And of course, the commercial opportunities as well to build a more prosperous and sustainable future. And going the other way, one has, uh, the Star of Nation, the technology in Israel uh, is heavily reliant on critical minerals, that, which are sourced to Africa. But there's the people to people bond. And you you mentioned it, Dan, I, very important, the, the, the unity the, between uh, many Christians in Africa, very strong, Christian probably is the continent where Christianity is growing uh, rapidly uh, over the course of the last century and continues to grow and be very dynamic. And many of the bonds that uh, those believers have to Israel because of their own Christian faith, pilgrimages to Israel. Uh, and so there are very strong linkages uh, across a full spectrum of uh, things. And that's what healthy international relations is built about, built upon people to people, but also built upon commercial economic, diplomatic, and security ties. Yeah, you know, this is uh, really not a Johnny-come-lately relationship because, as you've pointed out with Golda Meir, uh, Israel was, was barely 10 years old, not even 10 years old, uh, when it created uh, Mashab, which is the, the foreign assistance program of the state of Israel, bringing uh, folks from Africa to train that time in agriculture, uh, water technologies, such as they were then, uh, public health. Um, so uh, I have to believe that African leaders today, um, even though they, they, there was this, this great 20-year period after 
the Yom Kippur War, where um, relations had been severed and then they started to be reestablished, that leaders today are looking back and seeing that uh, in the files that there were these very strong and close uh, relationships, very much people to people. Very much, very, very much so, and it's and it's it's something that uh, I think you talk, especially uh, I like to listen to the wisdom of the elders, so to speak, and certainly uh, it's something I've uh, in my work as a diplomat try to listen to the voice of experience and history. And I speak to some of the older generation, even though they're they're out of government. And uh, in, the, in those cases, uh, there there are these re- memories and uh, people will point me to projects that existed and, you know, tell me, oh, I wish someone would restart that one uh, or reinvigorate it. So there, there are, there's a basis in which to rebuild after this unfortunate hiatus. What do you think uh, the lessons, and, and we're still learning them because it's relatively new, a year and a half, of the Abraham Accords uh, will be for Israel-Africa relations? What kind of impact do you think they'll make? And do you think that the Accords um, uh, also can help uh, diplomatic support for Israel at the UN, some of these biased resolutions that are introduced in the General Assembly, at the Human Rights Council, and other places? What do you think? Well, certainly the Abraham Accords uh, were a game changer, both in terms of perceptions, but in terms of reality. And many of the partners in in the Abraham Accords uh, themselves have very strong and vigorous uh, programs in Africa and their own engagements. The UAE is actively involved diplomatically as well as economically. And certainly one cannot forget that Morocco is an African country. Uh, it's very, very much re-engaged with Africa in a way uh, that, you know, for its own historical reasons, there was a period of, of political disengagement, but the economic engagement is very strong and there are possibilities of partnership. Uh, in fact, just right now, literally as we're speaking, one of the largest joint military exercise uh, that occurs annually in Africa is being hosted by Morocco, African Lion. It's a joint U.S.-Moroccan undertaking that brings in dozens of African countries as well as as other partners. And Morocco's economic ties throughout Africa, it's the largest African investor in West Africa, the the second largest African investor across the continent. Uh, So there are all sorts of synergies that that can be built on. It's a force multiplier, most certainly. Well, two countries that are not in the camp uh, that are moving uh, ahead are South Africa and Namibia. And uh, just recently, uh, they have been uh, pushing to reactivate the Committee on Apartheid uh, in the uh, General Assembly in the United Nations. Uh, And then we have Human Rights Watch and we have Amnesty International that also are pushing this, this very hostile uh, um, apartheid state narrative uh, out there in the in the NGO community. Does this in any way, or will it in any way, affect uh, the the growing relations between Israel and Africa? I mean, the, these um, the the apartheid narrative, uh, of course, is seen in, in a number of different places. Uh, but now uh, we see just in the last couple of weeks being pushed inside the UN with that and the Commission of Inquiry. This open ended. A commission established by the UN Human Rights Council to do nothing other uh, than to uh, and to bash Israel and to engage in bias against Israel. Yeah. Well, uh, in a way, I think there needs to be serious pushback, not just because of the policy implications, the diplomatic implications of this false narrative of the apartheid, the new apartheid state, but really to also preserve uh, the uniqueness uh, of the historical experience and what South Africans of color went through under apartheid. I, you know, if I may be so bold as to make a, a suggest a counter it would be for the very same reasons that many Israelis, many Jewish people across, around the world, you know, hackles are raised and sensitive, are very sensitive to any attempt at expropriation of the Shoah or, you know, banalization, if you will, of of the the term Nazi uh, to that somehow take away from the the very unique 
tragedy that occurred in the 20th century, the same way Africans, and especially South Africans, should be very sensitive at the banalization of their experience to, of what happened to them. And I think that's the approach to take that uh, rather than this be, uh, be, be using this as a label, they're instrumentalizing and therefore in a way cheapening their own ex, uh, suffering experience. And it's, it's remarkable that it's happening, but to be quite frank, uh, when one looks at the origins and the coalition and the po internal politics of South Africa, it's not surprising. Uh, it's unfortunate, but it's not surprising that the ANC, which is seeing its vote diminish election after election, uh, is seeking uh, the governing party in South Africa, seeking some sort of external boogeyman, if you will, uh, on which uh, to use as a foil. Yeah, it's a shame really that uh, the truth is that uh, South Africa, Namibia, and, and others outside Africa as well, uh, are not looking at the the lessons and the meaning of the Abraham Accords, which is to say, you know, there's so much to be gained uh, by um, normalization. It uh, doesn't mean that everyone will agree on everything. It's not going to happen. It doesn't happen in diplomacy and international affairs, but there's so much to be gained. And in a way, um, South Africa and Namibia uh, and the Palestinians themselves, the Palestinian Authority, uh, are locked into uh, a time warp of 1975 um, and um, are still engaged in kind of a zero-sum game uh, ideologically, which whose time, it was, of course, it was never appropriate, but whose time has passed. Yes. No, very much so. And, and it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a contradictory position. Uh, you know, for example, at the uh, the African Union summit in February, South Africa's push to uh, pull back the observer status that was that was uh, restored to to Israel, uh, and it's a uh, ambassador credited as a formal observer when South Africa itself maintains diplomatic relations with the state of Israel. So it maintains full diplomatic relations, but doesn't want uh, the African Union to even accord. Observer stats. That's a, a contradictory position that uh, the African Union Commission chairperson uh, Musa Faki pointed out in his response to that. Uh, uh, the but you know whoever said consistency uh, uh, is necessarily a characteristic of all diplomacy. Let's talk about the uh, the African Union. Israel is now an observer. Um, how how important is that for the trajectory? of the Israel-Africa relationship? It can, be, it can be important, but the challenge here is, uh, in many respects, it's been a long, at times difficult, struggle to get Israel. Uh, it ha Israel had an observer status with the Organization of African Unity, the, the predecessor of the African Union. But the birth of the African Union coming as it did actually uh, under the patronage of uh, the late and unlamented Muammar Gaddafi of Libya, colored uh, and Israel was excluded uh, from that observer status uh, uh, at the beginning of the African Union. So it's been a difficult path to get there. Uh, that has now been achieved and uh, richly symbolic that Israel's ambassador to Ethiopia, Ambassador Admasu, who himself uh, uh, is an Israeli of Ethiopian uh, background was the one who presented the formal credentials on that, but now it's. I think the 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 balance has shifted, and it's now the burden, if you will, or the challenge, is for Israel to make the most of it. Uh, now that it's in, to make the uh, the most of that access to diplomats at the African Union headquarters, that ability to engage at the African Union level, to make the case that there's a qualitative difference uh, that can be had in debates and cooperation in uh, other uh, aspects with Israel at the table as opposed to being ex excluded? Well, as we know, uh, Africa is not a remote continent for Israel. Um, there are many uh, concerns that Israelis have from Islamic extremist terror uh, to uh, large scale attacks on its border with Egypt. So it makes security a, a top priority uh, for Israel. And you recently wrote, and go back to Morocco here for a second, you recently wrote about how the 2021 MOU between Israel and Morocco for defense is a major accomplishment in that Israel would be setting the stage for formalized intelligence sharing, security cooperation, I suppose also on cybersecurity, um, et cetera. Uh, 
How might the normalization agreements with the Arab nations and defense cooperation with Morocco and North Africa uh, affect other parts of Africa in terms of security and intelligence sharing with, with Israel? Because we, you've talked about you know, the important role Morocco is playing now uh, in, with Africa itself, but how would the Israel component be brought into this? I think Israel brings unique capabilities that we all know about uh, in fighting Islamist extremism and terrorism. It's direct experience with that to the experience of systems in cyber and in other things that are above, well above my limited technical capabilities uh, that Israel can bring both in terms of governmental security, but also in terms of commercial and economic security. And so I think there are all sorts of opportunities that are opened up here. And in, in some respects, one can leverage the partnership the, with Morocco because Morocco's deep reach into, into Africa, but also uh, on the security front, uh, other actors. The United States, for example, has very strong investments and interests in African security. And so it's an opportunity to also strengthen the U.S.-Israeli partnership in realms and geographies where it hasn't traditionally been uh, been the case. And make no mistake, our adversaries are also looking at this. Uh, it's no accident that to replace the uh, late unlamented uh, Qasem Soleimani, the commander of the Quds Force of the Iranian uh, Revolutionary Guard, they replaced him with a guy named uh, Ismail Kayani, who is on the U.S. sanctions list uh, and has been active in Unit 400 of the, the Quds Force, a covert unit that has been active in Africa for a number of years and caught in arm smuggling and all, stirring up all sorts of trouble in that front. So our enemies are also going to be looking at this as an opportunity, and we need to also, uh, as partners and allies, uh, be vigilant to that as well. Let's look ahead to the future. What do you see? We've just, uh, we're still uh, suffering the effects of the pandemic, uh, greatly suffered uh, in, uh, on the African continent. There are food security issues, energy issues, water security issues, um, not to mention so, so many other uh, issues that are on that agenda uh, for, for development. Um, what do you see going forward, uh, not only for Africa, because uh, oftentimes um, the continent gets left behind um, when there's always a shuffle of, of priorities internationally. Uh, but now that Israel uh, has relations with more than 40 sub-Saharan <coughs> African countries um, and uh, now observer at the African Union, uh, a lot of things are happening. What do you see as the future? Well, I think uh, this is a relationship that really, and this isn't hyperbole, uh, the room for growth uh, is without limits. Uh, you mentioned uh, the, the challenges of food security. Uh, certainly climate change, which will require adjustments in how agriculture is done. And Israel has shown how you can make the desert bloom. And in many places in Africa, you have it. The Horn of Africa is in the fourth year of a historic drought. Uh, up to a quarter of the population of that region, uh, 150 million people are in danger of uh, starvation over the course of the next year. Now, uh, long term, the, the immediate term, of course, obviously there needs to be some assistance uh, from the international community, but in the long term, adjustments to agriculture, uh, more efficient use of water, uh, energy. Africa is desperately in need of energy. The typical African uses less electricity in a year than an American refrigerator, uh, just a, a very stark statistic. Because it's not because he or she doesn't want to use electricity, it's the lack of available power. And I know another one of your uh, guests in this program will be talking about th their efforts uh, uh, in that regard to contribute. And there's a lot to be done in the energy sector uh, that can be helped. But also on the diplomatic front, as 40 states, more and more African countries uh, engage with Israel, uh, this is the largest voting bloc in many international assemblies. Uh, in many cases, it's dispositive. Uh, so that's an, an opportunity to improve the diplomatic position and overall political security of the state of Israel. Uh, so I think there are all sorts of opportunities, and that's why I'm very optimistic, uh, coming from where we were to where we are and where we can be.
And uh, just as a final question, a subset of the previous question, um, how can the U.S. and Israel work together um, with Israeli innovation, technology, American wherewithal? Um, how can that be joined uh, to advance the relationships, not only between Israel and the African continent, but between the United States and Africa? Well, there, there's some wonderful examples. Uh, there's one in particular I, I, I like to cite, which is the trilateral cooperation between the U.S. Agency for International Development, USAID, Mashav, Israel's Development Cooperation Agency, and in this particular case, Ethiopia, the government there, on a trilateral base agricultural program to export, uh, to develop and export uh, fruit from Ethiopia. Uh, it's been very, very successful. And I think it's a good model uh, of what can be done, uh, that U.S. aid is present throughout the African continent, but Israel has some very unique capabilities that it's honed over the geography. After all, Israel borders in African states uh, with its border with Egypt uh, and its long connections there and its own experience of working in challenging climactic situations. And they, so I think it's, a, it's an opportunity to try lateralize many of these things. And the same could be said for uh, other partners in the Abraham Accords. Morocco has its own development program. Again, there's an opportunity there as, as well. And certainly the UAE has been very active across the African continent in a number of places in economic development, agriculture product, projects, et cetera. So I think there's a, there's a lot of ample scope for partners to get very creative. Master Pham, thank you again for sharing your insights with us on the Israel-Africa relationship from a U.S. perspective and for all that you've done uh, to promote that relationship. It's been a pleasure. Thanks. Thank you. Now, let's hear a special message from Togo's foreign minister, Robert Doucet, who shares his optimistic outlook for Africa's deepening and multifaceted relationship with Israel as more African nations normalize their ties with the Jewish state. And executive director of uh, Nye Bridge International, ladies and gentlemen, dear participants, uh, my fraternal greetings to everyone and my thanks to, to the first leaders of uh, the, the Nye Bridge International Association for the invitation the decision to associate myself and my country, Togo, for this uh, event on Africa and Israel uh, relations. Uh, I know your association, the Banai Bridge uh, International Association, is one of the world's uh, oldest public utility platform in terms uh, of its wonderful history, but also and above all its novel goals and uh, achievements in America, America and around uh, the world. The organization is helping to recreate the chance of hope in our world in a crisis from multiple uh, points uh, of view. And uh, I want uh, to let you know that before I return to the Africa and Israel relationship that is now one of the trajectory of or in a dynamic of positive development. I think it's time for everything and the time of uh, try to resolve all our interesting between Israel and Africa. For us, Israel and Africa have to work together and to build a new, uh, a new world. In reality, we are in a world where relationship is more important than uh, mistrust. Israel and uh, Africa uh, have understood that it's more in their interest to cooperate than to turn their backs on each other. The, parent the parenthesis on the time of uh, the coldness of relation between uh, Israel and uh, Africa has almost closed. It's time for a, relation, a relationship and the fact clearly 
speak themselves. Most of African countries, for 40 out of 54, now have a diplomatic relation with Israel. This is a reminiscence of the excellent relations between Africa and Israel in the 1960s, 1960s uh, in Africa, a period of uh, Africa, most of African independence, when Israel had up to 33 embassies in Africa and had observed status with the Organization of African Union, which became the African Union Organization in 2002. Uh, my, my personal uh, conviction is the revival of relations uh, between Israel and Africa certainly represents uh, qualitatively for, for war. A surge of hope, this uh, promising and reassuring prospects. This is uh, only fair to history when uh, we know that relations between Israel and uh, Africa are very old. In many African countries, it's a historical network between Africa and the Jewish community can be easily apprehended in the proximity uh, between Africa and Hebrew tradition, whatever we are in Africa, from the country like Zambia, Togo, my country, Mali, and another part in the African region. By reconnecting mostly with, uh, uh, with Israel, I think Africa is back in Israel, and Israel is back in Africa. It's a story of a double return symbol of uh, rebirth and reunion of reason. Israel is back in Africa, and this return is an opportunity for both Israel and uh, Africa. The warming of relationship, uh, of relation between uh, Africa and Israel shall contribute and further assist in the intensification of uh, Afro-Israeli relation, relations on the economic, commercial, cultural, and simple human needs. Levels. The GDPs of African countries combined make Africa the, the eighth largest economy in the world, and Israel is the 29th richest uh, country in the world. Both parties have an enormous potential from which uh, they can derive greater benefits of the respective uh, economies. With the operationalization in the near future of the African Continental Free Trade uh, Area, IFCFTA, Africa will become one of the largest markets uh, in the world, and it's uh, in Israel's advantage. Uh, to increase the level of uh, its economy and commercial uh, commercial exchange with uh, Africa continent. My country, Togo, which maintains very, a very good relation with uh, Israel, as you know yourself, uh, we have the mutual interest between Israel and uh, Togo in terms of, uh, of economy of trade and, uh, of course, cooperation uh, in, the, of, uh, cooperation in terms of agriculture, I say health, uh, security, etc., etc. It's uh, uh, the opportunity for me to thank once again the role of uh, MASHA, your International Development Cooperation Agency is doing here in my country, Togo. Togo cooperates closely, as you know yourself, with Israel in the field of agriculture, vocational training, health, digital technologies, and mining industries. Israel remains an important uh, ally of, uh, of Togo 
and the entire West African region in the, in the fight against uh, terrorism. The challenge of Togo today is to ensure that Israeli industrial, industrialists and businessmen invest more in our country. One of, uh, one of whose priorities is to work to boost the foreign direct investment. To conclude, uh, to conclude, I would like to stress that Africa and Israel uh, have an interest in uh, maintaining the, the, the newfound relation and strengthening the future of the benefits of each of the party. Long life Africa and Israel relation, long life the relation of friendship and cooperation between Israel and my country Togo. I thank you. With us now to talk about the emerging Israel-Africa relationship from an innovation perspective is Sivan Yari, founder and CEO of Innovation Africa. Sivan Yari is the founder of Innovation Africa, a nonprofit that brings Israeli solar, agricultural, and water technologies to African villages. She was born in Israel, raised in France, and educated in the United States with degrees in finance from Pace University and a master's in international energy management and policy from Columbia University. Stevan Yari has been working in Africa for more than 20 years, and over the past decade, using Israeli technologies, has brought clean water and light to nearly 3 million people across 10 African countries. Sivan and her organization, Innovation Africa, have received multiple awards, including the Innovation Award from the United Nations. She received the Light of Israel Award from the Israeli Ministry of Foreign Affairs and has been recognized as one of the most inspiring Israelis this decade by Grapevine, one of the 50 most influential women in Israel by Forbes, one of the 10 most influential Israelis in international business, science, and culture by No Camels, and one of the top 100 people positively influencing Jewish life by the al -Gaminer. Sivan, thank you for joining us today to talk about the Israeli technology that's helping to change lives in Africa and the role innovation is playing in deepening the relationships between Israel and African countries. Dan, thank you for having me. Well, the first question has to be, what inspired you to find this space to start this incredible nonprofit organization, Innovation Africa, which harnesses power and brings electricity and clean water solutions to African villages? What drew you into this particular place? Well, thank you, Dan. I, let me start by saying that there was no reason for me to go to Africa. I was born in Israel. Uh, my father was not a businessman working in Africa. He was not a diplomat. In fact, most of my childhood, my father was unemployed. And uh, when I was 20 years old, after the army, I was searching for a job in Israel and I was hired by Jordash Jeans. Now at that time, Jordash had a few factories across Africa and I was sent to Madagascar, one of the countries where they had factories. And it was there where I had the chance to spend time in the villages. And I then realized that actually growing up, comparing to the poverty that I saw in the villages, it was quite different. It was also very clear to me quite clearly then that the main reason why they are in poverty is because of the lack of energy. Um, children were not going to school because they were searching for water. And yet, as you know, there is plenty of water. We just need energy to pump it from the ground. Uh, I saw in medical centers without electricity. And so people could not have access to the basics like vaccines and medicines. So this is really what inspired me to uh, better understand the situation. I then went and got my master's in energy. And as a student, I started by bringing only a few solar panels at the beginning to one village and then another village and another village and to be honest, it is quite simple 
the solution exists. It is not expensive and it truly really makes a difference. Well, I know you have a video that tells the Innovation Africa story, so let's take a look. About 2.2 billion people living without access to safe water. A desperate call in need of an urgent response. Half of the continents have to leave their homes to access water. So access to safe water is one of the most fundamental pillars for human health. Africa is left behind and forgotten. The main challenge in Africa is the lack of energy. Because there is no energy, people are still suffering. Because there is no electricity in medical centers, there is no electricity in schools. But most importantly, because there is no energy, there is no access to clean water. And yet, the sun exists, the water exists. And with only a few solar panels, we can make a change. Innovation Africa is a non-profit organization with a very simple mission to bring Israeli technologies to African villages. Since 2008, we have brought solar energy to power schools, medical centers, and most importantly, to pump water in rural African villages. Once we bring clean water to a village, everything changes. Children are going to school, now there is better education, less people are sick. But what inspires us the most is when we get back to a village, we see agriculture, brick making, we see economic independence. Energy is the key to break the cycle of poverty. I think I counted 10 countries in which uh, Innovation Africa operates. And, you know, one would think, you know, you could have chosen one country and just focused on that. But you've, it's a big continent with a lot of countries. Uh, and, and 10 is really is quite something. Uh, tell us a little more, we'll have to go through every one of the countries, but um, maybe you can tell us about a few uh, and about the projects that you're engaged in. Dan, you're absolutely right. Uh, Africa is such a large continent and the 54 countries, uh, but we have the privilege uh, to be working in 10 African countries. And uh, we'd like to share with you some of the slides uh, and maybe some pictures of where we operate. The pictures that you're seeing are pictures from our project that we have just completed this year. So here you can see um, completed projects in Uganda uh, where we have brought access to clean water and electricity. In Uganda, we have already completed 160 villages. Uh, we're also operating in Tanzania. And uh, I'm pleased to say that in Tanzania, currently we are in construction in over 40 villages. In Malawi, uh, we are quite large now. Uh, Malawi is quite a poor country and uh, it is wonderful to see uh, the changes that are happening in the villages once we bring access to clean water. We're also operating in Zambia, one of our newest country, and in Cameroon. In Cameroon, we get funding from UNICEF, and we operate in refugee camps, refugees that are fleeing Boko Haram from Nigeria, uh, entering Cameroon, and uh, with the Israeli technology and funding from the UNICEF, we're able to bring clean water to the refugee camps. 
We are also operating in South Africa. South Africa is a richer country, but yet in many of the villages, uh, clean water doesn't exist. So um, it's true that it seems as we have done a lot done. We have helped over 700 villages, but compared to the demand, uh, to the need, uh, in my opinion, we haven't done enough yet. What have you learned about Israelis and Africans working together? You know, there really is a history to this because in the, um, I would say, 20 years or so, more or less, between the time of the establishment of the State of Israel in 1948 and in the late 60s, um, Israel had many programs uh, operating in Africa, development programs. Here was Israel, a young country itself, helping newly emerging independent countries. Um, and then that kind of uh, fell out for uh, a few decades, and now it's back. Uh, but there really is kind of a track record there. So tell us about how you, how you think Israelis and Africans uh, mesh so well uh, to create the kind of progress that, that you're bringing to these villages. Yes, then it's true that um, if we go back to Golda Meir, and the creation of Mashab in 1957. At that time, Israel was only nine years old, and yet Golda Meir said, we have to go and help. And uh, she started by sending um, experts from Israel to Africa to help in, in, in growing food, in pumping water. So all we do truly is just uh, continuing the legacy that uh, started with Golda Meir. And I must say that um, I think there are many similarities between uh, Israelis and Africans. I, I found them to also be quite innovative and hardworking and very much appreciative of us coming from Israel to be sharing our knowledge, to be sharing our technology, uh, to build infrastructure, um, to to allow them to be empowered. So um, from my own experience, it has been really terrific to see how much we are welcome as Israelis across Africa. Well, you've given a face and an added uh, dimension to the perception of Israel in a way that uh, many African nations uh, may not have otherwise seen. Uh, do you feel like you're uh, an ambassador for Israel and Israeli culture because of the positive message and uh, the incredible difference, really, that you're making in the lives of people at the village level? You know, Dan, I, I'm a proud Israeli. I'm a proud Zionist. And uh, I feel that uh, we have this privilege to be working and doing the work in the name of Israel. And most of the time, when we get to a village, most of them don't know of Israel. And if they have heard of Israel, it's from the Bible. And then they truly believe that God has answered their prayers and God made it so that now they have access to electricity and water. Basically, what I'm trying to say, Dan, that this is the first face of Israel they see. And also at the government level. Uh, when I meet with the different ministers and prime ministers and presidents, they all uh, very much appreciate of uh, the fact that Israel uh, is, is willing to help. So uh, I want to say that uh, I feel that I have this enormous privilege, me and my team from Israel, and most of us are here engineers, to be able to go, uh, work and share and uh, do what we believe we are supposed to do. How has the uh, pandemic impacted your work and that of Innovation Africa in the last couple of years, especially when clean water um, has uh, perhaps been more sought after than, than ever before? Yeah, I was quite worried, to be honest, Dan, when uh, the pandemic started, because one of the request it was for us to always wash our hands as you remember at the beginning and then i was wondering how we will be able to stop the spread of the virus in africa where they don't have access to clean water 
And how will they be able to have access to vaccines where you do not have electricity in medical centers? There are no refrigerators. So at that time, I want to say that thanks to our local teams, because in Africa, we have over 100 employees, full-time engineers. Most of them were trained in Israel. Thanks to them, we were able to do much. And only in 2020, we have provided access to clean water and electricity to over 200 villages. So we really understood even more back then uh, the importance of energy. Without energy, there is no access to electricity medical centers. And most importantly, as you saw, as as I mentioned, without energy, there is no access to clean water. Talk about ways in which your work uh, through Innovation Africa impacts women and can empower women in communities across the continent. Yes, because most women have to wake up quite early in the morning to go and search for water. I'm talking about 3, 4, 5 a.m. to go walk for one, two, three, four hours just to get 20 liters of dirty water, water that they know will make their kids sick. But again, there is no choice. So once we bring clean water to a village, everything changes. Children are now are able to go to school. Women have more time to take care of the family, to grow food. People are healthier. And truly what inspires us the most is the fact that when we go back to a village, let's say after a year of them having access to clean water, we see economic development. People are making money. They make businesses. The village is becoming rich. And most of the entrepreneurs are women. And that makes me happy to know that now they have gained back their hope, dignity. They are able to be better mothers and be financially independent. So it's true that it seems that what we do is quite simple, just harnessing the, the sun to pump water. But bringing access to clean water, it does a lot more than just that. Well, final question. Um... Uh, maybe a rhetorical question, let's see. Um, have you exceeded your original goals? And it's a big continent with hundreds of millions of people. Um, what else would you like to accomplish? Dan, I think that we haven't uh, done enough. You know, it does sound as we have helped over 3 million people, and, and it is a big number. But there are still over 400 million people that are in need of clean water. So my goal is to be able to continue village by village and to try and help as many people as possible. Well, you know, we take so much for granted, right? In the morning, you flip on the, the switch to get started, get the day started, the, the lights go on, you go to the tap, um, and we just, we don't even think twice about it. It's, it's right there. and then. When you juxtapose that ease of electricity and water uh, that that we uh, deal with, and to think about what you're doing to help people uh, to even think about having the possibility of readily available clean water and electricity right away is is really quite something. So, Sivan, really, it's been a pleasure speaking with you about your incredible work. Uh, we're excited to see what's next and to see the role that Innovation Africa plays in the emerging Israel-Africa relationship. So thank you so much. Thank you. Joining us to delve into the emerging Israel-Africa relationship and the solar technology innovations that he's bringing to the African continent is Yossi Abramowitz, president and co-founder of Energia Global. Yossi Abramowitz, an American-Israeli human rights activist, educator, and entrepreneur, is recognized as one of the pioneers of the solar energy industry in both Israel and East Africa. Named by CNN as one of the six top global green pioneers, by PV Tech as one of the most inspiring solar CEOs worldwide, and as Person of the Year 
by the Israel National Business and Energy Conference. Yossi Abramowitz is co-founder of the Arava Power Company, Israel's leading solar developer. Nominated three times for the Nobel Peace Prize, Yossi Abramowitz heads Energia Global Capital, an impact investment platform that advances the environmental and humanitarian goals of providing affordable green power to underserved populations as a fundamental human right. Yossi, thank you for being with us today to speak about the work that you've done in Africa and the relationship between Israel and Africa. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. So let's start with a basic question. What are the similarities between the energy needs in Israel and in Africa? Well, look, um, everybody needs the access to energy, water, um, they need food. You know, these are, these are kind of Maslow's uh, basics that, that everybody needs to have. Um, certainly in Israel, we have most of these um, and with the security that, that comes with it. In a lot of places in Africa, there's insecurity on, on food, water, uh, and energy. Um, but what's neat about the south of Israel is that it's actually the last of the African like palm trees, you know, show up in the uh, Sinai and then in the uh, Arava and the Negev. So, so there's, there's a lot when it comes to climate. And when people tell me that, oh, no, it's too hot in Africa, the panels won't perform or it's too dusty or, you know, or you can't like put them in the ground in a way that I was like, are you kidding? We, we, we just did this in, in the Arava and that, that's basically Africa folks. So I, I think from a climate level, we're, we've been able to prove that the similarities uh, now mean that Africa can move forward. You co-founded Israel's leading solar power developer, Arava Power Company. Um, I, I knew you in a very earlier incarnation uh, in, in our youth. Uh, what led you into this field and why solar? Look, uh, first of all, I have a long association with B'nai B'rith and, and with Hillel and the Soviet jury movement, uh, you know, and Dan, like, uh, you know, one, one, of the, one of the pillars of that. And um, basically in the Soviet jury movement, we did something which is quite ludicrous, right? We went up against the, the, the evil empire, uh, sort of in Reagan's words. And the idea of trying to bring, you know, to get millions of Jews out, it was the right thing to do and it was relatively quixotic, and yet it became the greatest, I think, the greatest human rights victory in the history of humankind. When I, when I got to Israel and we moved to a small kibbutz in the Arava, kibbutz Ketura, um, I had this idea, everyone said, you're a naive American kibbutznik, it'll never work. And I was like, wait a second, I used to get Hebrew teachers out of solitary confinement in Siberia and get them home. We can't change a couple laws in our own country. You know, aren't we, isn't the whole goal to, to be a, a free people in our own nation to determine our own destiny? So to, to me, when it became um, not just a climate issue, but um, this is good for Israel, this is good for the Jewish state, for our own energy security, for our own environmental footprint, and maybe for a way to be a, um, fulfill Isaiah's or the amended Isaiah of being a renewable light to the nation. So it, it, to me, it's consistent from my days being an activist and, and a Jewish educator and putting those values into action in what is now considered the greatest threat to humanity worldwide. So shouldn't, don't the Jewish people have something to say about this? And can, can't Israel be a constructive catalyst to solve this sure. tell us about the unique challenges in working with african nations to develop solar and in bringing what you've learned and what you've developed in israel to them and, and how many nations actually are you working with? so when after we did the first field in the middle east um we got people coming that year literally 58 different countries most of them poor countries, and most of them African. And they said, hey, Startup Nation, can you help us? And so I, I thought it meant like giving them advice for translating regulations. And they're like, no, 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 like, come. So we set up a sister company, the Energia Global, uh, Gigawatt Global, to see if, it, can we transfer our abilities and knowledge and de-risking and finance and, and technology, of course, to Africa. And at that point, 
no one had ever succeeded in doing utility scale in sub-Saharan Africa. So it, it felt like a worthy challenge. Um, and it actually felt like, and it still is a Zionist challenge. Herzl in his diaries writes that after he brings about the redemption of his people in their ancient homeland, he was gonna bring about the redemption of the blacks in Africa. And what he meant then really had to do with uh, ending colonialism and, and fostering independence. And so there isn't energy independence in Africa, it's the exact opposite. Um, so we see this very much in the line, uh, a straight line, um, not only from Herzl, but also Ben-Gurion and Golda Meir. They're the ones who started Israel's technical assistance program in Africa. And that was, that was a miracle program for a tiny little state. And the difference is that we have a business model for the tikkun olam, for the healing the world that comes out of it. It's very challenging working in Africa because it's Africa. Let's just um, call a spade a spade. Um, in Rwanda, we were lucky to succeed. And when we plugged it in, it was the first. It was the first under the White House Power Africa program, where the first success didn't come from GE or any of the big guys. It was a small, feisty, creative uh, group uh, in Jerusalem. And when we plugged it in, uh, it was supplying 6% of the country's power. We're currently working in uh, a dozen African countries at different stages of development. Now with Rwanda on the risk spectrum, it's actually well-managed countries over here. The trick is, can you do it over here? And we picked Burundi. So Burundi, unfortunately, heartbreakingly, according to the IMF, is the poorest country on the planet. And everyone said, there's no way you can do it there. But the value of, if you can do it in Burundi, they can do it anywhere in the continent. And think of, you know, the 600 million people in Africa without power, 300 million burning expensive and polluting diesel, right? And the population is gonna double in a generation. So the value proposition first on lift, elevating human dignity is infinite, right? But there's also a business, an impact business proposition. So I'm pleased to say that right before Glasgow, we plugged in a solar field in Burundi that is supplying 10% of the country's power. This is made, made in Israel solution. And we wanna thank the Biden administration for doing the 70% um, financing as well as other governments for helping us. And that now means, folks, there's no excuses. Everybody's life in Africa can be uplifted through energy access. And that, that seems like a good Jewish and Israeli vision to strive for. You know, you, um, you gave some context <clears throat> really for what you're doing um, by mentioning Ben-Gurion and Golda, uh, really, as you said, a, a, a brand new country uh, in the mid 1950s, already embarking on its own uh, foreign assistance, uh, foreign uh, training uh, programs, uh, really quite a story uh, in itself. So that's the, the, the context. But uh, how do you think the, the good work that you do uh, has helped Israel's image in Africa itself? Because obviously these folks know where you are, they know the company, um, this is no, this is not a secret. Um, how has, do you think Israel's increased investment in Africa overall? Uh, and I'm not talking only dollar investment here, or shekel investment, I'm, I'm talking about its investment in the future of Africa. How overall has it changed perceptions? So first of all, I want to say that Israel has a lot of friends in Africa, a lot of friends. And, um, and frankly, in a moment of truth, people in leadership, a lot of regrets that they, um, after there's back to climate, right? So the Arab oil boycott following the Yom Kippur war uh, was used as a kind of a weapon by Gaddafi, who was heading the, um, the African um, Union at the time, or the, whatever it's called. Um, uh, and, um, and they, they Israel, Israel lost all of its friends and, you know, with promises um, of petrodollars and, and also with the threat of, of a cutoff of, of resources. And, and Africa today, if that, if that didn't happen, Africa today would be a transformed continent. There'd be so much less poverty because what does Africa need? People need food. We, we can grow basically anything anywhere. What do they need? They, they need water. Well, I think we have the best water 
technologies and management systems, they, they need inexpensive and green power. Well, hey, this is why we've been put on the planet. Um, so, and these people, they believe in the Bible. It's a scary thing, Dan, I have to tell you, you come with a kippa and, and, and you know, green kippa, right? they think you can walk on water. And that's a lot of responsibility. Like we, we don't have the luxury to fail people. If we're making commitment to a country, to a community, to a province, we have to deliver because they go, ah, oh, nothing's worked, but here come the Israelis. And, and so you have kind of the biblical halo. You have the startup nation uh, halo, which is also very strong. Um, coming with U.S. government financing, so it's like another big plus. So they, and even even the Muslim states, deeply, deeply, deeply respect Israel. And I have to say, the Abraham Accords have been um, a boon for at least interest in our business, even from countries that don't yet have relations, but I believe soon will, uh, with Israel. I want to thank the previous and current administrations in the White House for advancing the normalization, um, not just in the Middle East but also in Africa. And I, I believe that uh, they'll be well rewarded for their friendship because then would be honored to provide their green energy and the economic and social development that comes with it. Well, briefly walk us through how this, how this works from the time that you've reached an agreement with country A or B and the time that somebody uh, flips a switch and, and a light goes on or um, the, the solar energy is used for for some some other productive purpose. What is the what's the time frame involved in this? Look, the, the 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 best case is what happened in Rwanda, from having the idea to to plugging it in. It was only two years, and that that that, that that's like a record time. I never actually want to go through that again. Um, but as I said, we're in about a dozen countries, and most of those countries were in there more than five years, because we went with Prime Minister Netanyahu. Actually, I preceded that, it was Lieberman. People don't remember when Lieberman was a foreign minister with the five countries in Africa together, not just me, but um, a delegation with, uh, you know, agriculture, water, et cetera, um, kind of paving the way. And even Yitzhak Shamir had gone when he was pr Prime Minister to West Africa, kind of trying to undo um, the damage uh, from the you know the Yom Kippur War and the, the boycott that ensured. So there's, there's definitely been kind of the, the chipping away. Um, I can tell you that if a country signs a bankable power purchase agreement with us and um, you know maybe helps a bit with the studies, it takes the US government about six months if, if, if we're lucky, it could be a little bit more to do the financing, right? Takes us about six months to a year to build, depending on the on the size of the field. But again, we're 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 we have deals with ten universities in Ethiopia. But there's been a war. There's been COVID. There's been uh, uncertainty, and so that's behind schedule. We're, we have two projects in Kenya. There's an election uh, happening now. We're just waiting for things to get settled so we can hopefully do that. Uh, these are revolutionary projects at the last mile generation where there's there's a grid, but there's no power. The grid is thirsty. And so the, for the people are poor in that area and they need the electricity for the economic development. In Zambia, we have a great project and I, I know that Neighborhood has been um, active there. It's the first place in Africa that will be co-located wind and solar in the same location. So the sun goes like this and begins to set and the wind comes up and it's great. Um, we're in Mozambique in the north where most people won't invest. Um, uh, we're in South Sudan. We're hopefully about to break ground in South Sudan. Juba uh, will, will actually be the city that a highest proportion in Africa will come from renewable. We're doing eight megawatt hours of storage there, please God. Uh, in Washington today, working on the, the financing on that. Uh, Liberia. Nigeria, Guinea, a bunch of others. So we're 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 plotting along, and it it's basically how do you shift an energy profile of a country? And there's a lot of entrenched interests. Some of it is ignorance. Fine, we're really good partners, but um, people trust Israel and they trust our track record, um, and we we hope to be able to roll out many more of these. So really. This is not this is not something once once you're at the table and you're discussing this, 
it's not something that is way off into the future. This is really a, a deliverable, literally a deliverable. Yeah, I'm actually very upset with a lot of the um, um, consultants of the World Bank and the EU who tell these African countries, oh, you know, yeah, you, by 2030, you can get the 30%, maybe 40%. With the foreign ministry, we just took eight African ambassadors down for an overnight to the Arava. The Arava, not just being Africa-like, is the first region in the world that's 100% daytime solar in the world. And it's from Eilat, including the hotels, all the way up to the Dead Sea, Red Sea to Dead Sea. And another two, three years will be the first that's night and day. We brought the ambassadors and, you know, each of them have energy poverty in their countries and have, let's call it modest goals for solar. And we say, uh, Your Excellency, this is what 100% looks like. Do you want it? They go, but we're a poor country. I said, no, 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 we'll, we'll bring 100% financing. Really? Really? The answer is, of course, this is not futuristic. People are talking about 2050. No, we're at a time as a species. And Africa can actually lead. Africa can lead. Do you go beyond uh, supplying power and instead work in partnership with nations to develop sustainable infrastructure? Because while, while power, obviously, it's, it's so important, it's so central, we've talked about that, but there are a lot of other things that go into moving a country up that ladder. Um, yeah. Are you involved in, in that as well? So the Power Africa program uh, highlighted that energy access is sort of the missing ingredient for a lot of the rest. Like how do you really have agriculture that doesn't spoil if you don't have refrigeration, right? Or, or how do you have water for your agriculture if you, don't, if you can't pump it or clean it? You know? um, so it, it, the, the nexus of these things are coming together. And this is where Israel actually excels. I think there's, there's, there's a role for um, uh, the, the global Jewish community as well as the state of Israel to do a better job kind of bringing all of our products and services as a country together, almost like a concierge service to a, to, to a country. Um, so we're very involved with community development everywhere we work. We, we ask the community, what do they need? They need health care, they need education, they need water, like just the potable water. So we're, we're very involved in modeling that. We ourselves, we're you know, a little feisty group, but we, we can't take care of a whole country. But we, what we can prove is that it's viable and affordable and uh, transforms the role of women. Um, and uh, we're, 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 like, I think there's, there's, there's just people go, oh, Africa, you can't get past here. No, 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 no. You can go all the way. You can go all the way, very entrepreneurial, young continent. They all have cell phones now, which not only do they need to charge them for the energy, but they see, they see what they're missing. They can see what the rest of the world looks like. They can see what modern living and, uh, and, and access to things that would lift the dignity of their families and lower the infant mortality rate and increase their yields. And so there's demand for what we offer, and it's a privilege to be part of the solution rather than kind of the old exploitative uh, view to Africa. Golda Meir did this in partnership. And I, I feel we've, we we're privileged to carry that torch to, in, into a new era. Well, the African continent is huge, more than 50 countries. You've mentioned the number of the countries that you work in. What are your goals? Look, I, I um, in the dozen or so countries we're working in, we, we, we want to get those fields done and we want to get them done now. Um, uh, that will also be profitable, you know, after I think three more countries. Each field itself is profitable, but, you know, it takes time to develop. Uh, we're open for business, we're open to, for impact investors, and we're also in DC and elsewhere um, doing our, our Series A. Um, but the goal is to, we're usually the first crazy people in any given country. Because people say South Sudan, impossible, Burundi, impossible, Northern Nigeria, impossible, like Djibouti, impossible, Somalia, impossible. Like, you know, it's just the idea is no, we're the can do people. <laughs> like, you know, im tir tsu. Like, if you will it, it, it you know, we, that, that, that's our DNA, right? That's back to the, the Herzlian kind of impulse to also see. So, so we're an echo, we're an echo of that impulse. We want to break through. And so if we can be the first movers in each of these countries, 
get the diplomatic, you know, piece of it also. It's, we're not complaining when they're, you know, winning over friends. Um, but we'll be delighted when other people follow uh, and come in. The big boys coming in and investing and and doing it. But we we de risk we de risk this market. So we want to make money for our impact. The Zionist investors, great, that's fine. But they're patient capital. But the main thing is, let's let's show everybody it's possible. And now that we did Burundi, let's get those other six hundred million people power and let's transform their lives. Well, I like your your reference to this being Herzlian. You know, this is the um, uh, this year, the 125th anniversary of the first Zionist Congress. Uh, so it uh, it's good for us to uh, not only pause and remember, but also to to analogize here. And uh, it seems that it's fitting uh, in in your case. Just one final question: uh, You've been nominated for and received many awards and honors for your entrepreneurship and your technology efforts, including being nominated for the Nobel Prize three times. Not everybody can say that. What does it mean to you as someone who is Jewish to receive that kind of recognition for the work that you're doing in Africa? Look, you, you don't you do not do it for the recognition. You do it because it's, it's a mitzvah with a business model, right? Um, it, it's, and it's hard work. I'm not gonna, you know, it's really, really hard work, which is why no one else has, has done it. So it's, it's nice once in a while to get kind of that, that approval. I, I have the uh, privilege, burden and responsibility of being Ali Wiesel's student when he won the Nobel. Uh, so he, you know, uh, my wife complains that he created expectations and, you know, why am I running around the world doing all this stuff? Uh, um, it's nice to be nominated. It's not like we've won. I mean, there's 300 nominations a, a year. But the, the main thing is, can it amplify our voice? Can it bring more capital that we can deploy? Uh, can it open up more diplomatic channels that didn't exist? Because um, what we're really dealing with, uh, people think the, you know, is electrons, but we're dealing with trust, right? It means a country trusts us for 25 years. That's the currency. And if there's an award or a nomination that it increases the, you know, our brand equity is a trustworthy, and we're not coming to exploit. We're not the old European models. We're not the Chinese trying to grab their minerals, you know, through the back door, any of that. Israel has no colonial history in Africa. It's, it's the opposite. We, we come as partners and anything that kind of enhances that. And I think, it is the speed to trust that we have as both an Israeli and Jewish group and because of our track record. Um, and we come as partners, not, not, not in any parochial way. So any award is, is, is nice. I hope Greta wins the Nobel this, the, this year for getting people out into the streets. If for some reason the Nobel committee wants to give it to two climate, her for calling out the urgency of the hour and someone else, uh, not to be named because there's climate solutions for the poorest people on the planet, we, we wouldn't complain. And neither would my teacher, uh, Professor Rizal. Well, certainly congratulations on all the great work that you've done and, and all the terrific work that lies ahead uh, for you. Um, really, Yossi, it's, it's been great having you with us today. Thank you for joining us and speaking with us about something so important uh, to the state of Israel, to the continent of Africa, and to all of us. Take care. China. We're privileged now to be joined by former Ambassador Herman J. Cohen, who brings invaluable expertise, experience, and knowledge about Africa to our exploration of the Israel-Africa relationship. A retired career diplomat and specialist in African and European affairs, Retired Ambassador Herman Cohen is president of Cohen and Woods International. Established in 1998, the consulting firm provides strategic planning services to African governments and multinational corporations doing business in Africa. Since then, Ambassador Cohen has negotiated private power investments in four African countries, Togo, Rwanda, Senegal, and the Democratic Republic of the Congo. Ambassador Cohen retired from the U.S. Foreign Service in 1993. His last position prior to retirement was Assistant Secretary of State for African Affairs under President George H.W. Bush. 
And during this period, he led negotiations that successfully ended decades-long civil wars in Ethiopia, Angola, and Mozambique. During his 38-year career with the U.S. Foreign Service, Ambassador Cohen served in five African countries and twice in France. He was the American ambassador to Senegal with dual accreditation to Gambia from 1977 to 1980. During assignments in Washington, Ambassador Cohen also served as special assistant to President Reagan and senior director for Africa on the National Security Council and principal deputy assistant secretary for intelligence and research. And during this period, he was the State Department's representative on the National Intelligence Council of the Director of Central Intelligence. Ambassador Cohen's honors and awards include the French Legion of Honor, the Belgian Order of Leopold II, and the U.S. Foreign Service Distinction of Career Ambassador, the highest rank in the Foreign Service. And in 2020, Ambassador Cohen received the American Foreign Service Association's Award for Lifetime of Excellence in Diplomacy. He's also written three books. Ambassador Cohen, we're honored to have you here today. Thank you very much. Glad to be here. So let's start really with you, and then we'll get into the, the policy issues. Um, how did it come about that you developed this very strong interest in Africa, which really led you through a, a very important career in the State Department uh, dealing with African issues? Well, my, during my university studies, I got very interested in the problems of underdevelopment. How do you get these underdeveloped countries to live on their own and to be self-sufficient. And I saw that the major major issues were mainly in Africa. So I started to, to study Africa in college. Uh, actually, I, I, did a, I did a master's thesis on, uh, on African underdevelopment and what, what is to be done to, to help them become modernized. So, so that led me to become sort of an African specialist. So when I joined the Foreign Service, it was a natural for them to uh, send me to Africa during a, overseas assignments. So the discussion really today uh, in this particular program that we're doing relates to Israel and Africa. And I know you follow these issues closely, but I want to go back, if we can, into the 1950s. Israel is barely um, born in 1948. And then in the mid-1950s, it starts um, a, an assistance program. In Africa, so tell us a little about what role Israel played in Africa historically. Well, uh, the the birth of Israel as an independent nation and the birth of many African countries as independent nations sort of went on parallel tracks. The first African country to become independent of the European colonialists was Ghana in 1957, and every African country that became independent. Israel saw as another vote in the UN. And since Israel was having many issues with the United Nations, they said, let's get involved with Africans as they become independent and try to make friends with them. Plus the fact that they also saw that they could help Africa with, with their technology and, and their advanced, uh, their advanced uh, information uh, that the Africans did not have themselves. So the... The, the policies of Israel in the 1950s, for example, through their, um, their foreign assistance program called Mashav, which uh, brought um, folks from Africa to Israel, for example, in the area of public health or in the area uh, of agriculture, especially, uh, that really kind of started a, a program which really blossomed. And Israel did establish uh, relationships, uh, diplomatic relations with a number of countries. Um, at the same time, American policy is also um, looking at Africa, establishing these relations. Uh, how do you think Israel's involvement and, and the U.S. involvement during that very formative period mirrored each other? Well, I think we were encouraging Israel to do, do more, much in Africa because they had a lot to offer. And uh, for example, in the area of water technology, the drip irrigation, uh, medical uh, agriculture in general, uh, the Israelis had a lot to offer. And the, the United States policy, as, as uh, enunciated by President Eisenhower in 1957 was, we're not interested in the Cold War in Africa. Our only interest is economic development. And so Israel was right there to have 
make a tremendous, tremendous contribution to African development. So we encourage them, have relations with African countries and bring in your technical assistance. It, it was a natural complement to what we were doing. So the relationships really were growing. And then comes the Yom Kippur War, the Yom Kippur War in 1973. Um, and a number of African nations, in fact, most of them actually, uh, severed uh, relations with Israel. Um, the sense here is that many did so reluctantly. It was kind of a go along to get along at that point. Um, but that given the relationships that had existed and had been built up since the 1950s, really uh, was making a difference um, in, in many African countries. Now, there was kind of a dip for about 20 years. Um, and then Israel started to resume relations uh, with the African countries again in the 1990s. Tell us about a little of your personal experiences and involvement in that process and bringing them back together. Well, at, at the Sinai War in 73, the Egyptians went to the Africans and said, look, the Africans are occupying African soil. You cannot have relations with them. because of that. So all African countries except three broke relations uh, with Israel. And there was a long hiatus of nothing happening. Okay, so I became Assistant Secretary of State in 1989. And President George H.W. Bush gave me an instruction. He said, see what you can do to have African countries resume relations with Israel. It's been much too long since the Sinai War. It doesn't make sense anymore. So following his directive, every time I went to Africa to meet with heads of state, for many reasons, I would always include this. Look, isn't it time to resume relations with Israel? It's been much too long. Okay, so flash forward to 1991. I get a call, I was Assistant Secretary of State, okay. I get a call from the Israeli embassy. The Israel, Israeli ambassador wants to come to see you. Now this was very unusual. The Israeli ambassador in Washington doesn't spend much time on Africa. He has somebody beneath him who does Africa. So coming to see me, I said, well, something's going on here. So he comes to my office. This was in June, 1991. And he says, I have a letter for you from Yitzhak Rabin, Prime Minister of Israel. What does it say? Thanking you for all you've done to help to persuade African governments to resume relations with Israel. And, and that was the case. I, I had persuaded so many African governments to was in relation. And I'm very, very proud of that letter because, uh, you know, it wasn't easy for him to write that. And so uh, I felt very good about that. And ever since then, uh, Israel's relations with Africa have really blossomed. I mean, been, you know, now there are 41, they have relations with 41 out of 46 African countries. They have embassies in 12 African countries. They have an observer status at the African Union. And, and they're really doing a tremendous amount of good work in Africa, both as, as Israeli government aid, technical assistance, and private sector also is very active in Africa. I mean, the last time I went to Lagos, Nigeria, which is one of the biggest cities in Africa, I was told that there were two Israeli day schools there. I say two Israeli day schools, what is that? Well, there's a tremendous Israeli private sector presence in, which you don't read about it because it's not part of politics. So, so Israel is very active in Africa, both as government and as private sector. Well, let's go back to the, that period before you received that letter from Rabbi. What was it that you were saying to the African ambassadors or others that you met with to try to restart uh, these relationships? What was the... What was the agenda that you brought to them? Well, I said that the, the original reason for breaking relations, Israeli troops occupying the Sinai. Well, they didn't occupy it for that long a period of time. And so much time had gone by since 1973, and Israel had so much to offer Africa. I, I, I spoke to every uh, African head of state that I met. I said, look, it's... It, it doesn't make any sense not to have relations with Israel because they have a lot to offer and they want to, and they want to offer support to Africa and economic development. So I just kept sounding that note every time I saw them. And eventually I think all but three 
uh, countries uh, resumed relations with Israel. So essentially, you were pushing on an open door. Basically, yes, because the previous experience with Israel was always positive. What role do you think um, Israel should, could play in Africa going forward? Now that, that all of these relationships have been, except for three, have been reestablished, um, as you say, observer status at the African Union, um, a steady stream of, of visitors, of high-level visitors, cabinet-level visitors, it's going in both directions between African countries and, and Israel. Um, I would think with such a huge continent, so many countries, um, and so much potential, the sky is the limit. So where do you think this can go? Well, I'd like to, basically the big problem for Africa is not what outsiders are doing in Africa. It's what Africa is not doing for itself, basically. There's a lot of corruption and there's a lot of... Uh, national revenue be, that is being diverted uh, to non-governmental non uh, work. So I think we, the Israelis and we and, and the European Union, we have to work more with Africa to, say, to reform their own internal structures so that, uh, that the development work where we're doing really takes hold and, and is distributed and the, the revenues and the benefits are distributed to the people. That's not happening now. I read an interesting statistic in the World Bank the, the other day. There is $1 trillion of African private money sitting outside of Africa. How do we get them to bring that back and invest it? So, so many Africans themselves don't have confidence in their own government. So internal reforms, we have to put pressure on the Africans, the Israelis who are trusted, the Americans and the European Union, internal reforms so that uh, wealth is distributed to the people and not to certain political leaders. Well, with issues now, we've had a pandemic and, and a, a vaccination crisis um, over a period of months, that in some places uh, still continues. There are food security issues, cyber security issues, water, uh, electric power, um, a, lot of, a lot of unmet needs, that, that are there. So what potential do you think there is for U.S.-Israeli cooperation in Africa in, in promoting uh, development uh, in, in all of these areas in order to, uh, to uh, lift and improve uh, the lives of Africans? I think we're already doing it. You know, we're working very closely with the Israelis on things like uh, agriculture, water technology, energy uh, and, and counterterrorism, you know, training people. I'm, when I was based at the uh, U.S. Embassy in the Democratic Republic of the Congo, I lived next door to a, an Israeli army major who was there part of a team training the, uh, the Congolese army. And uh, one day he invited me to a special event. He said that the Israeli ambassador, who is a retired Israeli army general, the president of the Congo, President Mobutu, who are trained in Israel uh, as a paratrooper, and the Senegalese ambassador, who was a former Senegalese general who trained in Israel. Now, what was this special event? All three of them parachuted out of an airplane just to show, to demonstrate what the Israelis had done to help them. And this is true throughout Africa. Well, it's a really a, a, an, a more, an, an important and um, I think very insightful story uh, that uh, you yourself bring to this discussion about Israel and Africa and the role that you played, uh, particularly at that very crucial moment um, in trying to um, repair the relations and get them back on track and clearly um, they are very much back on track, as, as you've indicated. So thank you for all that you've done over the years to advance that relationship. Ambassador Cohen, uh, thank you for sharing your insights with us. Really, it's been an honor to have you with us. It's a pleasure for me. Thanks for inviting me. I want to thank all of our distinguished guests for being with us today to help showcase the incredible work being done in the fields of diplomacy, innovation, security, and more between Israel and Africa. 
And a very special thanks to Foreign Minister Robert Duse of Togo for his poignant remarks that he shared with us. The program is ultimately just a snippet of the groundbreaking work going on behind the scenes and publicly. If the progress of the last decade is any indication of what the future may hold, the best is yet to come for the Jewish state and the African continent. A recording of this conversation is available on demand on both our Facebook page and our YouTube channel. And make sure you visit our website, beneighbors.org, to learn more about our important work. And last, but certainly not least, I want to thank all of you for joining us, and I hope you'll return for future B'nai B'rith programs. Until then, take care. We look forward to seeing you again soon.